Education on the 28th of March. Can we please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Mr. Schwartz. I will read the rules for public forums. Speakers should identify themselves. Statements should be brief to the point and limited to three minutes or less. Board members should not be expected to respond during the forum to statements made by speakers. Statements should relate to Charles County Board of Education agenda items or any education related topic with the following limitations. Personnel matters, pending or potential appeals, or the comments regarding the actions or statements of individual staff or the private lives of any individual are not appropriate topics. Proper language and decorum are required at all times. We have one speaker this evening, Jerron Tross. Good evening. Um, I want to thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak, and I don't take it lightly. Uh, my name is Jerron Tross. I live in Waldorf. Two or three weeks ago, I uh, reached out to file a FOIA request and was, was given a runaround by getting um, A lot of times when I call for a FOIA request, I already have the information. I work for a $3 billion corporation called IHS Market. So all we do is information research. So nine out of 10, when I call for the information, I already have it, trust me. But, you know, I was out in the, in the community and I saw a board member and, you know, $350,000 is not even, it's not nothing to play around with. And I think it's imperative if a citizen asks for the information, give them the information. Folks should play with them. I think that's asinine. Secondly, you know, we know what went down at uh, Westlake and North Point. Not even here to even mention that again. But we, six, seven years ago, we had a, a situation that pretty much embarrassed our community. Now, you guys, HR goes through to get the information from C CJIS, and uh, they go through an evaluation through uh, Department of Social Services. We all know Google is not the right way. It's illegal to do a, uh, a search. However, there's a lot of information out there. Uh, there's a company called HireRight. You may want to invest in that. You know, you've had two, what they call them, educational uh, specialists from out of North Point, out of a basketball program that commits, that commit a crime, I think we have a problem. I'm gonna say this and I'm gonna leave. There's some other information out there on two other uh, instructional assistants that you have. Of course, I'm not gonna drop it in the public domain, but I have it right here on the, on the disc. I would encourage the board, HR, to investigate, investigate, because we don't need this to happen to our kids again. Again, there's two more, two more out here in the school system with questionable backgrounds. You need to get the information. It's in the public domain, but you can't use Google for an employment search. It's illegal, but it's in the public domain. Now, I don't understand why CJIS can't get the information or social services. It's there. You just put the first, middle, and last name in it. It is there. Trust me. I have it here on the thumb drive. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Good evening, everyone. This evening, I'm joined with Steve Andritz, who's our Director of Planning and Construction, and we have two information items. We have a presentation on school construction, and we also have an information on an MOU, which needs to be established between the Board of Education and the Maryland Stadium Authority for Built to Learn funding for three upcoming school projects. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. I'm sorry. Mr. Hurd asked me to do something, and, and take that um, 
before you get going, because I know you have a lengthy presentation, but Mr. Hurd, if you wanted to very briefly um, what you requested. Uh, thank you, Chair Lucas. I just wanted to very quickly recognize that we have two student member of the board candidates uh, who showed up to observe tonight's meeting. And uh, these are two of the 11 candidates. All candidates had an opportunity to attend, but these are the two who took us up on that offer. Uh, it's Amuya Akula and Vernon Stover, both are 11th graders at North Point High School. And I just wanted you all and the public to have an opportunity uh, to see them and to remind students that they have an opportunity to vote for the 11 candidates uh, from now until Friday at the close of business. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Hurd. Apologies, Mr. Hahn. That's okay. <laughs> right. So a lot of times, <clears throat> Mr. Andrews and I are here when we're talking about the project status update, we'll throw around some acronyms and we talk about large amounts of funding for various school uh, construction projects or renovations or systemic replacements. So this evening we have a presentation which will hopefully educate uh, the board on some of the terminology that is used and also the, the public. So we have a number of major state and local funding sources. The first is our CIP, the Capital Improvement Program, uh, which you hear us talk about on a monthly basis. A new one is the Built to Learn Act, which I've talked about, which will be part of our second presentation. Uh, some information on the MOU, uh, which we'll establish between the Board of Education and the Maryland Stadium Authority. Uh, a newer program, the Healthy School Facility Fund, the Aging School uh, Program, which has been in place uh, for a number of years, School Safety Grant Program, local county CIP funding for various projects, and then lastly, ESSER funding, which is a one-time federal funding source uh, for a number of things, uh, mostly for instructional initiatives, for catch-up opportunities because of time lost in the classroom uh, due to the pandemic, but also uh, allowed for construction funding for making improvements to HVAC systems. So the first program that we're going to talk about is the CIP, the Capital Improvement Project, I'm sorry, program. Oh, that worked just a second ago. Sorry, thank you, Mike. Okay, um, as we mentioned, there are all these different funding sources, and Mike and I are going to jump back and forth between them and run through them. The first one we want to talk to you about is the Capital Improvements Program. This is a normal process we go through every year that is a shared funding source between the county and the state, and your uh, percentages of cost share split depend on your county's wealth and the state provides that information to all the different counties every year. We have a slide in there about what that looks like. Um, and then the state comes out with a dollar value of what that uh, available funding will be for all 24 LEAs, uh, which includes Baltimore City. And they say, you know, apply for your projects. And we bring to you guys in, um, in um, August and September our capital improvements program with the different projects and the priority order we have established for the board to approve and we move forward. Uh, what's important here to note is that the LEAs identify and prioritize the needs of the schools and the projects. The school board then approves the projects and um, we also do have a process we're mandated by the state that a local government must submit to uh, support your program and we get that in a letter from the commissioners usually in uh, early November and that's due to the state. So the priority order is submitted to the IEC in October. Um, for example, this year our priority order started with number one which was repayment of money that is owed to finish out the state share on the Eva Turner project and then right on to um, other major projects. So we do everything in our CIP from HVAC replacements to roof replacements, renovations, additions, new construction, all of those are type of projects that you may see through a CIP. Um, and the slide also mentions the different times that the funding is made available. So we submit in early October, the first decisions come out in December for 75% of whatever the available uh, total state budget is. And uh, at that time, the state will project what your funding is going to be all the way through to the end. Uh, then the IC makes their recommendation on 90% in February, and the 100% is approved uh, after the May meeting and officially starts 
uh, dispensing money July 1 for that fiscal year. As an example, um, the state is actually capping the value that each jurisdiction is available to get based on a 10-year average and based on a $280 million uh, state funding total. We had been getting, uh, based on information from the state, a 9.7 to 9.8, $10 million value. But when you take that number for us and you take all those 10-year numbers and put them together, that number exceeded 280. So what the state did is said, this is how much that delta is, and they reduced everybody by that much, and they have provided information to us to say that our 10-year average from here on out is going to be $9.1 million. Just to also show you in FY19, our uh, final allocation was $14,856,000. Our request that year was $36 million. In FY20, our final approval was $13,938,000. Our request was $38 million. FY21, we received 9,753,000. Our request was 32 million. Uh, FY22, we got approved for 14,625. I'm sorry, thank you. Yes, 14 million, not 14,000. There's a big difference. That would bring there. the 10 year average yes. down a little yes. bit. <laughs> uh, we requested $54 million. And in FY23, you'll notice that they're projecting for us a much larger number, uh, 200, uh, excuse me, 22,894,000. Our request was 46 million. Partially that's uh, a lot higher because this year we qualify for some special funds that we have not been eligible for, uh, which is the EGRC grant we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and there are additional funds that are being thrown in to the CIP to push the number up. And then also if a school system's not using close to their 10 year average, that money can be put forth to other counties. So yep. we also believe that's what led to the 22 million but regardless we are ecstatic because as Steve was mentioning that 9.1 million targeted we had received that email uh, two or three weeks before we received the February notification on the 22 million so we were ecstatic to receive, to receive that higher number so as I mentioned before the cost share per county is based on your relative wealth and you'll notice on this chart we list what our number is for FY21 and FY22 uh, Charles is in bold here. We were at 61% state share and 39% local share. That is just the bricks and mortar for the building. That does not include buying land. That does not include the design costs or um, any of the technology, furniture, fixtures, any of the FF&E is not included in that. Additionally, anything that's change order related during the project. So if we dig up bad soils and we have to do extra work as a result of that. None of that is considered in there. That's always a local eligible item. And then for comparison, you'll see that a county that's considered to have a higher county wealth uh, based upon that index, such as Montgomery County, they have a 50-50 share between the state and the local. And you can also see Somerset uh, gets 100% from the, the state. So there's no local match from uh, Somerset County for their construction projects. Then just for comparison, our number did go up for FY23-24. We got increased to 65% state share, which is where we are right now. The next major source of school construction funding, which is recent, is the Built to Learn Act. <clears throat> that was enacted in law in 2020. Uh, and originally it was going to be $2.2 billion in construction funding for the 24 LEAs. Uh, but that uh, number has been dropped down to $1.8 uh, billion for FY23. <clears throat> for some, some comparison with the Built to Learn, there are 17 LEAs that share 11.5% of that $1.8 billion. And we are one of these 17 LEAs that uh, are a part of that share. And that's based on, for those 17 LEAs who get that 11.5% 11, of the overall funding. It's based on 2019 enrollment numbers pre-pandemic uh, because as we're aware, our school systems enrollment dropped as, this, as did most other school systems uh, during the course and uh, after the ending of the <clears throat> pandemic and schools uh, returning back to in-person instruction. Uh, so if you look at an overall number for Charles County, it's about 25 million or 1.25% out of that 1.8 billion if you look at three of the larger school systems, such as Montgomery County, Baltimore City, and Baltimore County, they're each receiving $420 million in school construction, uh, which is higher than the 17 smaller systems combined. But again, 
Uh, there's an old saying that my grandmother taught me, you never look a gift horse uh, in, in the mouth. So we are happy to be receiving that additional funding, but we do have some concerns uh, with how that is being distributed amongst the, the 24 LEAs. And just for a little extra background, that was something that a lot of the 17 counties lobbied against to change because uh, we represent something like 22% of the total student population of the state, not 11 and a half. So unfortunately, that was what ended up as the final result. If I could, uh, so this, in the mindset, it, it, maybe that's not the right word, but the, the thought process is that previously each county would get money to, to they would have a rank order perhaps of, of what they felt their projects were but at a state level the thought process were was well in your county your number one priority could still be much lower down the list than the number 20 priority in another county and that's why those those counties are getting the bulk of the money is that pretty much a thought behind this I think there's some truth to that yes uh, I think it's also that um, it's based on the requests that are out there. Um, as you saw, our list of requests, if you were to look at the annual request from somebody like PG or Montgomery, that's one of the larger systems in Maryland, but also in the country, their request numbers are in the hundreds of millions per year. Uh, so I think it's an attempt to address some of those, but some of that is also based on um, the need of some of those larger systems as well. Yeah. Thanks. And these projects are going to be managed by the Maryland Stadium Authority, so that's why uh, we'll soon be having a discussion about the MOU that we'd like to establish between the school system, the county government, and the Maryland Stadium Authority. And this is uh, issued uh, through, through bonds, so the money's <clears throat> being funded through the issuing of bonds. So as with the CIP, which is managed by the AAC, IAC, I'm sorry, <clears throat> this will be managed by the Maryland Stadium Authority. So one other point to make note of here is that this money was intended to be dispersed over a 10-year pro period. And so some of those jurisdictions that are getting you know, $400,000 will not get all that money this first year. It's going to be over several years. But school, or school systems that are smaller that are part of that group of 17 LEAs, such as Charles County, we already know what our four projects are going to be. Uh, as a matter of fact, the MOU that we're going to talk to you guys about after this is for three of those four. And so we will likely go through our money within um, four to five years, and we will be completely spent out, built, done. It'll be over. I mean, so that's the reality of the situation that we will be facing uh, for the money for Charles County tied to Built to Learn. And on the next slide, you'll see the three projects that Steve is referencing. <clears throat> the first is the J.P. Ryan Elementary School Kindergarten Edition which would be a 9,000 square foot addition of four kindergarten classrooms and one pre-K classroom with a total project cost of 4.2 million. The second project is Malcolm Elementary School, which is a 7,200 square foot addition of four kindergarten classrooms, an activity area for the 88 students, along with a renovation of 2,000 square feet of two classrooms to improve circulation to that addition with a total project cost of 4.6 million. Uh, we're also going to be doing some additional work with that through some of our own uh, local money. Uh, we're going to be adding a uh, sprinkler system to the entire building. As codes have changed, obviously Malcolm is an older building, but with the new addition, we would have to have a sprinkler system for that building. So we're going to go back and retrofit the remainder of the building to have a sprinkler system. <clears throat> and then also uh, adding a fire tank for that sprinkler system because that school is on a, a well. It's not tied into a, a public water source. And then the third project is the Maurice McDonough High School renovation slash addition, which is a project consisting of uh, adding 12,000 square feet of new addition and then renovating 35, I'm sorry, 35,000 square feet of existing space and it, with a total pro project cost of about $17.8 million. And then a fourth project, uh, which is still going through the planning stage, is a limited renovation of La Plata High School. Keep in mind also, these are budgeted numbers. These are not necessarily the actual construction bid numbers. The next item we wanted to talk to you about is something called EGRC, which is a special pot of money that's available for uh, the initials, or the acronym stands for Enrollment Growth and Relocatable Classroom Capacity. 
Uh, this was something that's been around for a while. It opened in 2015, but the threshold was initially set at 300, just above where Charles County's number of portable classrooms is. When the Built to Learn Act uh, was going through the process and through the review, that number was actually lower to 250, and ultimately that was passed, and that number has now kicked in for this FY23 for the first year, and we are now eligible for money. Um, there's two ways to get it, either through the number of relocatable classrooms or through a percentage of growth in student population over the state average. Uh, there are now, with the relocatables, two new jurisdictions that qualify that didn't before, which is Charles County and Howard County. Uh, before that, based on relocatables alone, it was Prince George's Montgomery only that qualified for that particular item. So now you have one third of the school systems in the state of Maryland are eligible for that source of money. Uh, additionally, EGRC, uh, as was mentioned, is based on your um, FTE equivalent enrollment for September 30 or your number of portables. The budget was supposed to start out this year at $40 million that would be dispersed across seven school systems with this EGRC funding and Charles County was going to get about $1.7 million of additional funding. This money goes into our CIP for, for funding projects. Uh, Governor Hogan re recently increased the total budget when he increased the overall CIP budget and um, the information on the BTL projects, the Built to Learn projects. So the EGRC grant has increased from $40 million to $95.4 million, and as a result of that, Charles County is going to get $4.3 million from uh, FY23 from funding from EGRC. So that's what also part of what's increasing our projected FY23 uh, CIP funding to 22.8 million. Okay. Next is a Healthy Schools Facility Fund. <clears throat> this was a new program that was established in 2018. Uh, and <clears throat> what that is doing is giving school systems an opportunity who apply for this. Uh, funding source to make improvements to HVAC, uh, addressing mold mediation, uh, temperature regulations, uh, plumbing issues, uh, particularly in reference to lead waters. We know that uh, all school systems in Maryland have to uh, do lead testing for the public water as part of uh, House Bill 270. And for us, uh, we're three projects, I'm sorry, two projects that we have designated uh, this $2.7 million that we're receiving for this, uh, one of them being the John Hansen Middle School Roof Replacement. That is a project that we had had on our CIP for several years and did not get state construction funding. So we're very excited uh, to have this project finally approved. And uh, since it's a separate funding source, it's not taken away from our, our CIP. And then a second project that we're going to use uh, part of this $2.7 million for is the, uh, some improvements to the HVA system at Matthew Henson Middle School. There is a local match requirement for this. So as we talk about that county uh, state split based upon the county wealth uh, index, uh, it would be 65% funded through the state, 35% local match for these two projects. Two other points to keep in mind for healthy schools is that no matter what the dollar value is, 50% uh, of that money goes to Baltimore City. Then the other jurisdictions are eligible to apply for what's what the remaining percentage. Uh, I believe the number this year was 40 million total, so 20 went to Baltimore City and 20 was available for the other 23 jurisdictions to apply for. Um, as Mr. Heim mentioned, the local match needs to be there, but the benefit to us was we were able to get the roof project at uh, John Hansen that we've been asking for for a long time. We already had the local match established, so there was not a additional burden because of that. But we were also able to address an issue where maintenance had a problem with a significant uh, piece of HVAC equipment to get this in. So it wasn't just taking off another project off the CIP. It was an opportunity also to have this other type of project that wasn't even on the radar yet and put it in there and still get approved and move it forward. So we were always looking for other funding sources out there, whether it be for new school construction or more limited renovations or systemic replacements. So this was the first time that we had applied for this program, which started in 2018, and we were very happy to receive some, some funding for those two projects. And we'll continue to uh, apply in future years for additional funding. The next uh, funding source we're going to talk to you about is ASP, which is uh, Aging Schools Program. 
this is a uh, project that is established a certain percentage for your county and you get an e equal dollar amount year to year to year. Charles County receives uh, 50000 a year out of uh, six million that's allocated for this year. So we have actually let it build up for the last three years and we're allocating that money. We've just recently been approved to do a electrical switch gear replacement at Arthur Middleton Elementary School. Um, it's a school from 1974 and has some issues with uh, the age and date of that equipment and needs to be updated. And so we're actually putting that forward to be approved as part of that. There are certain stipulations that they have to uh, make improvements to the facility. Whatever you're doing has to last at least 16 years because that's the, st the state's bonding requirement. And generally the schools have to be 30% or greater free and reduced lunch, free and reduced meal, excuse me. Another source of funding for us has been the school safety grant program. And this is managed by the Maryland Center for School Safety. Uh, this program started in 2013 and there were some changes that occurred in 2018 with some legislation put forth by Governor Hogan and then the state uh, delegation uh, as a result of the shooting in Parkland, Florida. But what it does is it created a source of funding for school systems to take on security to initiatives at individual schools or overall in the school system. Uh, so some things we have done in past years uh, with that funding source. We've installed additional cameras in schools, updated old cameras, installed film on windows and doors, and added lightning detection at, at high schools, among some other uh, projects not mentioned. Then additionally, we always work with our uh, local county government budget folks. Uh, we have worked very diligently to build a good relationship with them to achieve additional projects that are not going to be state funded. They may be one-time funding sources for just a single project, or it may be opportunities to do a, t a type of project at several locations across a couple of fiscal years. So these are just a few examples of that. Uh, we had a project a few years ago that was a multi-year project for playground replacement and improvements, and we made significant upgrades to um, somewhere between six to 10 elementary school playground areas. Uh, we have a relocatable classroom project that's in our local CIP that's a recurring year to year and we get money that allows us to either go in and renovate a, a unit or potentially move units as we need. Uh, as we know we're going to be moving a number of units from Benjamin Stoddart this year as we work to finish that renovation project and they'll be going to um, several different locations. So you have a project to move it, clean up the site and then obviously set it and uh, hook it up with all the appropriate utilities at the new location. Additionally, we had a uh, security initiative project where we did a number of things with guided entry vestibules at schools, uh, card readers, some door replacement, a little bit of fencing. Um, we've had some site improvements projects, which were multi-year. Can I just Sorry. add also to that security initiative? That's also when we, made, we created the guided vestibules at each of our schools to make sure that we had a way of vetting visitors so when they were uh, let into the front uh, office area, they could just not freely go into hallways and stairwells. And that was a large funding source. That was $5.9 million we received from the county for those security initiatives. Mm -hmm. And we believe they've been very successful. If you look at how the schools are uh, established with these entrances, how they're using them, um, we, we worked very diligently with the schools to make sure that it made sense. Sometimes the simplest fix wasn't always the fix that got done because of uh, other adjustments that needed to happen to make it work properly. We did some site improvements where we had a project to address parking improvements and repaving of lots. And then we have something that's a recurring year to year project called various maintenance, which um, has been used for a number of equipment upgrades. Uh, it is not enough money to do uh, significant work. So it ends up being one or two pieces at different locations. So it may be a boiler, uh, a pair of boilers, a chiller, a cooling tower, things like that. But all of that stuff is important because as we chip away at those, we don't let them get to the point that they're failing or on the edge of failing. And just one last point with the local projects, you know, with, as we mentioned with the CIP projects and with the Built to Learn and the Healthy Schools, that there is a local match from the county. Those projects we just referenced from the local, those are projects that, uh, you know, we've designated, uh, worked with folks at 
uh, county government and fiscal services uh, as priorities for our school system and they've been very generous over the years in supporting uh, these projects. Next we want to kind of divert uh, to a little bit of a different topic uh, with public school uh, construction and those are P3s. As we're aware, uh, local legislation uh, was put forth uh, which went to uh, the state and on March 15th there was a hearing uh, on the discussion of P3s and public-private partnerships. Uh, so that was House Bill 739. And that was for the purpose of establishing a work group to study the fiscal and operational viability of P3s for Charles County Public Schools. Uh, that legislation has passed, uh, so we're waiting for more information to come forward on that. Uh, but what it will be doing is creating that work group. And you can see uh, the various members uh, who would be a part of this work group, two senators appointed by the President of the Senate, two delegates appointed by the Speaker of the House, two members of the Board of Commissioners, County Commissioners, two members of the Board of Education, uh, the chair or the designee from the IAC, and the executive director of the Maryland Stadium Authority or that person's designee. Moving on to the next slide, uh, the work group would study, again, the fiscal and operational viability of using P3s. Uh, they would look at studying the implementation of a P3 partnership for Charles County Public Schools. The work group would study how the P3 may relieve significant burden uh, using their words for funding new school construction and renovations for Charles County Public Schools. And this work group would make these recommendations uh, before December 31st, 2022. So it's a, a short turnaround. And that committee would also be staffed from uh, members of the school system. Uh, we've talked about P3s from time to time during our project status update. Uh, back in 2019, December of 2019, uh, we met with a group, uh, METCON, at the request of uh, Commissioner Collins. Uh, there's a group that has done some P3s in North Carolina. More recently, Steve and I have met uh, a couple times uh, with Prince George's County uh, and their director for P3s, uh, since they have uh, P3s for funding school construction in uh, Prince George's County. Uh, they have designated, uh, created a position for a person who oversees their P3 program. So we've had a couple discussions uh, with uh, that gentleman from Prince George's County uh, to get gather that, inf information. Excuse me, is that Dr. Forsett? Uh, give me Jason one. Jason Washington? Yes, Mr. Jason Washington. Yeah. The, the other thing that's um, important to note is that Prince George's County, through the Built to Learn Act, didn't qualify for funds like you saw on the list of jurisdictions there, of the named counties with percentages. They actually were approved for a separate funding source to uh, support a P3, a private public partnership. And so they are actually working through that process now of how they get, that, you know, getting that done and getting the work done. They, uh, I believe, have targeted that they're going to do six projects uh, and turn them all around in a very short time frame. So at this point, we turn it over for any questions. Thank you. It's a lot of good information. Um, any questions? Ms. McGraw? Thank you very much. There was a lot of good information. But I, on this last slide, um, the second bullet is a little concerning to me. And maybe you can explain if you have knowledge of or is this something that the work group is going to work on. But where it comes down to saying maintaining and operating schools in Charles County, I assume that's after the construction. But do you know if that actually refers to I'm concerned about privatization of mm -hmm. our workforce, our building service workers. Does this refer to that? It, it very well could. Uh, there's a number of models. You want me to just? Sure. Okay. There's a number of models of uh, private-public partnership. Some of them are as simple as design, finance, construct, and some of them take it the entire way of design, finance, construct, maintain, and operate for 30 years. And so under those models, you're correct that the maintenance of the, of the building and whatever systems are in it or the daily cleaning can all be part of that master agreement. And so 
you would not have your staff doing it because it would be controlled by the organization that is is overseeing the P3 because that's the only way they can um, maintain that they're going to meet certain benchmarks that are going to be in their agreements for quality of schools and uh, cleanliness and the uh, indoor air quality and the temperature set points and all those things without them having that if that's part of what their agreement contains they need to also then have that maintenance and that operation piece as part of it and those maintenance agreements can range from 20 to 30 years but yes to your point so if the in year two the chiller goes down then most likely it's going to be the responsibility for that group uh, to make any repairs uh, to the system so it would not be our people making those those repairs so that would only be on new construction no, P3 would only apply to whatever projects are um, put out there for that. So in the example that I was talking about with Prince George's County where they did six schools, their P3 conditions would only apply to those six buildings. It wouldn't apply to the, the additional hun almost 200 schools they have. It's just whatever is subject to that agreement. That clears it up for me. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Wilson. Um, as always, um, you guys do an excellent job in presenting the overview of these pro projects and I think we're very fortunate in Charles County um, to have the, the type of quality of management and o o oversight so um, I, I think that goes without saying that because we do such a good job of managing um, as as we all know and so that the public understands um, the discussion about new school construction is as a result of changes to the adequate pu public facilities document. And previously, whenever there's been uh, changes or updates, there's typically, there would be a task force. I think there's been, it's been done before uh, twice in, in, in this third iteration, for whatever reason, the county commissioners elected to proceed in making the changes without a task force, which in turn, because of this change in policy, the best estimate, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, so that the public understands, um, it's around 300 million plus dollars, of which we need now need to find the funding. And so this work group that you are referencing is a reaction to, hey, if if it's the commissioner's policy to promote residential growth, we're going to generate a need for new schools. We now need to have a way of paying for it. I was under the impression that at some point there would be a presentation of the work group's findings as in terms of the ways in which we could pay for funding, one of which was public-private partnership. We're now at a point, we've had a legislative, a joint legislative session uh, prior to uh, convening the Maryland Assembly and where there was an exchange of priorities um, and we were not aware that our local, local uh, delegation was going to propose this. So in their mind that, that this was a potential way of paying for construction. I'm bringing this up um, because it, you're now saying that a feasibility study for a public-private pro partnership has been approved. So I will ask again, when will we have an opportunity to weigh in on the pros and the cons of not only public-private partnerships, but other mechanisms in which the county government can raise money. Um, the second point I want to bring up is what Ms. Uh, McGraw has alluded to. Um, I think we need to be clear on what this work group is going to be working on in terms of the responsibilities of renovation and construction. Because when I read this legislation, it gives me the impression of privatization. And I think the public um, needs an opportunity to know and understand that. 
So I think there, that one, I'm asking very you know, graciously, can we have this conversation with the, the county commissioners so that, so, so that we're clear on the, the roles and the responsibilities because you guys have done a good job in managing schools and we're now talking about, um, they are now talking about, they are talking about this injection of public-private partnership. I'm not saying personally if I'm for or against it. What I'm advocating for is sitting down and having a clear understanding of what are the pros and cons. And um, uh, the other thing that had we been afforded an opportunity to weigh in on this legislation, I think having representation from the business community and parents on this work group instead of having all elected officials. Because we're, we're talking about a $300 million <coughs> <coughs> management challenge and a feasibility work group and nothing against the, the staff or the, the other uh, entities that are involved, but this is something that I think that the public should have been, you know, uh, this is something that I think the public definitely needs to be clear on. I, I also kind of want to look at our, our attorney in terms of the roles and responsibility of the Board of Ed is uh, oversight of construction, um, you know, some input in terms of, are, is this a responsibility that is now going to be taken away? Will the management be taken away? And I think, again, the public should have an opportunity to weigh in on this. And I'm, I'm trying to encourage and promote collaboration on this issue, but it almost seems like the train has left the station on this. And we're, you know, we should have had a lot more discussion about this. And I'm, I'm, I know that you guys are sitting here hearing, hearing these points, but I'm hoping that the public is listening and ha have a clear understanding. I think potentially this could be a good thing, but I again, what are the pros and cons of this? So thank you for allowing me an opportunity. But I think my big my big concern is we we constantly ask our other elected officials for opportunities to collaborate. And this is a prime example of this legislation was put forth when there were opportunities to, to collaborate and we've not, we have since not had a discussion about, you know, from this school allocation policy. And just as a <clears throat> reminder for the public, the 300 million that uh, Ms. Wilson is referencing, that goes back to a presentation that Steve and I did, I don't know, maybe a year or so, Ago, and that was based upon uh, looking at a 10-year period uh, of enrollment growth based upon an assumption that with the final build out of the St. Charles neighborhoods, Glen Eagles in, the, in those neighborhoods, but also taking into consideration uh, development that is at this point starting to get underway with uh, developing the infrastructure to support it. Heritage Green, the large project that we've talked about uh, in the La Plata area, would, which would be upwards of 3,100 units uh, over about a 10-year period. So uh, based upon that enrollment growth projections, uh, Steve and I had put together some numbers, uh, what we'd need in terms of additional schools. Uh, we've already you know, referenced uh, elementary 23. We've referenced elementary 24 as part of that, middle school nine. Uh, in that 10-year period, we also put down numbers for, for a high school. Uh, so that, you know, that's <clears throat> where the $300 million uh, comes to. And uh, we've mentioned a couple of times in recent uh, board meetings that Steve and I, along with Karen Acton, are part of the uh, construction task force, which was formed after the changes were made to the, the APF, uh, the Adequate Public uh, Facilities document. Uh, and we've not put forth uh, that final presentation. I know that the board is anxious to hear that presentation. Uh, we were waiting for staff to complete that, that presentation, but 
P3s were uh, not uh, part of anything that was advocated with that group that is still finalizing that. And our assumption uh, is uh, we've been working with that, that group, which also includes staff from county government, uh, representative from the town of La Plata, and a representative from the town of Indian Head. Uh, that the, Their desire was to give the presentation to the commissioners first, uh, and then a presentation to, to the board. Uh, so we are still waiting for when those presentations uh, will, will be scheduled. Yeah, the other, <clears throat> excuse me, the other thing to add to that, that analysis also took into account the changes that were made to the, with the APF revisions, which created those priority development projects, um, and it set a threshold, and I think it was about 600 units a year through those allocations that could be done, and the sunset provisions that were created where the school allocation waiting list um, in essence had a sunset on how long a project would wait, six years being the maximum, or right now, that right before that, there wasn't a time limit. So based on all those changes, that's where that analysis came from. Uh, the other point I'd like to add is that when we talk about public-private partnerships, the first question we're gonna have to ask is what's the need? What, what do we need for a private-public partnership to benefit us? You know, if you have a system that has a serious backlog of deferred maintenance, then that says that they need to fix the buildings, but they also probably need help with the maintenance portion on it because they, they've got that deferred maintenance. You know, we, we have a small school system. We have 43 buildings, but we have a very active maintenance department who works diligently to achieve work orders. And I believe, Mike, the numbers are in the 90% range of work orders completed within a month's time frame. So they, they work very diligently, and they complete a significant number of uh, work orders each year. So that's not to say that we don't have needs but the needs that we have may be different than what other jurisdictions have. So the first question in my mind uh, when we have to start this exercise is, what's the real need for Charles County? It can be, P3s cannot just be new construction. They can also be renovation or replacement schools. So it doesn't have to be just new construction. So that, just yeah. a couple extra points. And, 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 and let me jump in real quick, Mr. To what Mr. Andrew said, and I know Ms. Wilson, you, you wanna say something else, but I think that's one of the things I've, you know, on my own, I've looked at this quite a bit, and, and Prince George's County, I think one of the things that we need to do is, is for all of us as board members to, to really better understand what this is. And, of course, now we're going to, since the legislation has passed, there will be a committee, but, but I think all the board members need to, to understand, myself included, uh, as much as possible what this means. But to your point, it's a completely different paradigm in Prince George's County with, with the number of projects going on. And, and you know, this, the county still has to put out money to fund the P3. So if, if, if for whatever, you know, if they're showing an interest in doing this, that means you're showing an interest in putting out money. Well, if they're showing an interest in putting out money, why can't they do that in the process that we've always done where we've demonstrated that we're good stewards of taxpayers' dollars and we get things done? And we're not going to hire somebody that maybe has never done this before or done this very limited process because especially building schools, you don't want to do that. We don't want to build schools that are only going to last 20 years, um, personal opinion. I mean, we, we have schools that are 50 years old that look brand new because we take care of them and they're built well. And in the long run, that saves money. So I just wanted to, just wanted to emphasize that, that you know, your opinion was, was the, of course, I appreciate your opinion. You know much more about it. But from a board member, I just wanted to amplify that, that, that we're just in a different, totally different paradigm. Ms. Wilson, you wanted to say one more thing. And I, I think, uh, Chairman Lucas, you, you hit it on the head. That's the reason why I'm, I'm encouraging this discussion with the, the county commissioners. They've kind of taken off with this, this legislation, and we haven't laid out a good, you know, you know a, set, a, a collaborative assessment. The second thing, as I look at the superintendent, so that's now we're just, in this discussion, we're just talking construction. We're not... We have, haven't had the opportunity yet to sit with the superintendent and saying, if, if in the next 10 years we do build out these schools, how much more money is going to, it's going to cost to operate and to expand programs. So we really need to take a look at that implication as well. That's why I'm encouraging you know, the conversation. I do have a request um, and it's, it's something that, uh, if it's the will of the board, it's my un un understanding, um, I got contacted by a citizen that the 
adequate public facilities document either has been modified or a proposal is being put forth to add public-private partnerships in the adequate public facilities document. If, if, if you could verify that, if that's the will of the board, I hope that's not the case without having, a con once again, a conversation about the pros and cons of that. So we will, we will check with staff, with planning and growth management with, with the county. Uh, but and correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, in order for that to happen, uh, they would have to go through a public process, yeah. just like they had done recently when they made the most recent changes. But we will make contact with staff to see if there are any other proposed changes to the APF. Yeah, changes to the adequate public facilities ordinance would require public hearings before the planning commission and the county commissioners. So one last question, and it's one of the things that we could, when we sit down and collaborate, is if a municipality, uh, and this is not hard to, if a municipality wants to uh, find a company um, to enter into an agreement, and if the county agrees to it, they could enter into a public-private partnership, correct? What, what are the, you know, what are the parameters? Well, I don't know that I can answer that because this would be our first uh, discussion in doing that. Public, private public partnership is not new to governments. They've been used in a lot of different venues, especially when you talk about infrastructure such as roads. But the venture into schools has been something that has only recently happened here in the United States. There have been places in Canada and the United Kingdom that had P3s but they had those as a result of significant population booms. For example, the stuff in Canada was tied to the oil sands and all the workers that came in as a result of that and a significant bubble in population, and so they had to do things immediately. Um, they're only just getting started here uh, for schools, and Prince George's County is the first one in Maryland. So I don't know that I can really answer your question yet on that. And something to keep in mind, one of the big areas for savings is most of those projects are design build uh, which can cut down on the, the turnaround for uh, starting construction and completion of construction but with that design build it benefits a larger school system who's built it, building multiple schools at one time or multiple schools in a, a small period of time because you're typically using a prototype school so if you are building a number of middle schools or renovating a number of middle schools at the same time you're going to use a prototype design for that uh, and, and we're not opposed to that, uh, but in, you know, historically, when you look at how often we build a new school in Charles County, there's usually a significant period of time. And you know, before Billingsley, uh, the previous elementary school to be open was Neal Elementary School. So there was over a 10-year period uh, between those two schools being built and open. And there are many changes that occur with with code. So we found in our experience because we don't build schools, uh, an elementary school and another elementary school within a short period of span uh, enough. That uh, to use the prototype uh, design again. Not that saying in the future when we may be building schools uh, in a closer period of time, and, you know, two elementary schools within a five-year period, then you can you know more likely look at that prototype design. But that's where you're seeing seeing some of the savings uh, for school systems, especially larger school systems who use the P3s. That's one of the areas for significant savings. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. You had a question. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a, a question again with the private uh, public private partnership second to last slide where it speaks about uh, who makes up the work group um, I don't see it on the slide and, and forgive me if you if you did cover this but I don't see anyone from our staff that would be familiar with uh, school construction and maintenance is that correct so the, the so we're not school staff are not officially part of the work group uh, but we will provide staff for the work group, which our yeah. assumption is, Steve, that, that we will be putting <laughs> together uh, that presentation and also providing guidance. So if you yep. look at the, the last slide, the first bullet, uh, one of the stipulations is that the Charles County Board of Education shall provide staff yes, for that work group. Sorry. So we would be, have the opportunity to designate who that staff would be. And again, we believe that it will be that staff who is selected who will put together the actual study and the, the presentation. Uh, and also provide some some guidance and so-called expertise. 
Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I saw that on the next page. Um, and but that that is my would be my concern with the the public private partnerships. I'm not opposed to it. I'm not opposed to finding ways to help uh, help with with the budget and help with money to for infrastructure and maintenance. But we need to realize that that you guys are the ones that know how to do this. I mean, this is what you do every day. And as long as whatever happens, the professionals know what to do and oversee it to a degree, I, I think we really need to make sure that that is the key focus of this. So thank you. Any other questions? One of the things, um, as Mr. Hyde mentioned, we've had several discussions with, with Prince George's County about their process and um, in reviewing this and looking at, you know, where this may lead for us in the study, uh, a, a suggestion was made that a financial consultant is something that probably wants to be brought into this process on behalf of the school system. So I think that would be something that may be a really important ask for Charles County to be brought into this process as this group starts to look at things and, and look at how financial models lay out and what makes sense. So that may be something to keep in mind for any discussions that may happen. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. And our last, uh, we'll make this brief, uh, information item is the MOU, uh, which we need to establish uh, for that built to learn funding. Again, those projects are managed by the Maryland Stadium Authority uh, in contrast to the CIP projects, which are managed by the IAC. So one of the uh, things is we have to establish that MOU between the Board of Education, the MSA, and our local county government. So this document has been going back and forth uh, between our staff, our attorney, uh, folks at county government, and also folks at the Maryland Stadium Authority and their legal counsel. One thing I would like to clarify, though, is that when Mr. Heim says manage, uh, in the case of Charles County, what he's referencing is they are managing the process of issuing the bonds and the approvals of the projects and then ultimately the paying the bills on the construction projects. The three projects that we're moving forward with for uh, the McDonough project, the J.P. Ryan kindergarten edition and the Malcolm kindergarten edition will be managed by Charles County Public Schools and are assigned to contractors through our public bidding process. We've actually bid out all three of those jobs already. We already know who the successful low bidders are, and we've been going through the process with MSA. Actually, the first one of those, uh, which is Malcolm, has actually gotten its notice to proceed, and a contractor is given his direction to get started. The second one being McDonough, which uh, will be signed sometime shortly and given to the contractor with a notice to proceed as well. So. In the example of these three here, Maryland Stadium Authority is just acting as a funding mechanism for Charles County projects. They're not actually managing. That's important to note because Maryland Stadium Authority has two different models with how these projects can go. One where they actually manage projects. Uh, Maryland Stadium Authority has managed projects for Baltimore City for some time under the 21st Century Schools building process. And in the um, language with the Build to Learn funding, Baltimore City was mandated that MSA is going to continue to manage all of their construction projects for that BTL funding. So uh, with our three projects, as I mentioned, it's just funding. So what we did is um, we just laid this out for you. As Mr. Hyde mentioned, there's been a number of iterations in the board docs information. You have a brief write-up of uh, the process that we've been through, where we stand right now, and the current draft MOU with MSA and Charles County government. That's important to note because, as Mr. Hyde mentioned, we've been discussing this with the Maryland Stadium Authority since July. Initially, the discussions were an agreement with just Charles County Public Schools and Maryland Stadium Authority. There was a lot of back and forth with them internally and with their attorney general. And ultimately, it came down that even on projects of this nature, the county has to be a party to it. So we've had to get a revised agreement from them. We've been circulating it through county government for their review and look at they're going to have to review and approve it, just like we're asking you guys to do. Um, and then the MSA folks would approve it as well. Tonight is a report item for you where we're just presenting this. Uh, we'll take any questions you have, and then we would bring it forward in April for a formal vote. Um, and then the commissioners 
we'll have to also do that. We've been in contact with the budget and finance staff over there, uh, excuse me, the fiscal services staff over there. They uh, look like since the commissioners are not meeting on the 12th or the 19th, it's probably gonna be the 26th of April for them. And the one other thing I do wanna mention is that this is the working draft. There is a piece that may change on the funding totals for J.P. Ryan because when we opened the, pro opened the bids, the J.P. Ryan project cost was over budget. So we sent information back to the IEC who has to approve your projects to ask them to increase the funding. They've been reviewing that. Actually, their IEC designees are supposed to look at that tomorrow and then they'll make a recommendation, but the formal vote wouldn't happen until April 14th with the full IEC meeting. And then we've been working with the county about covering the difference there. So the numbers that are shown would change based on whatever decisions are issued there. So I wanted to make sure and make that note. Uh, so with that, I will not read through the uh, overall write-up, but I would open it up if there are any questions from the board. I see no questions. Okay, all right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So next on the agenda is um, COVID-19 staff lead. Um, we all received by email for our last meeting um, information from the superintendent um, outlining questions that, um, that board members had with regard to leave during COVID. Dr. Navarro, is there anything that you wanted to say or did you just want to entertain any questions from board members? I'm happy to take any questions um, that the board members may have. Okay. So I just have one um, and um, I just want to make sure that this is clear that um, for, for anyone who took leave and and if there's a date associated with this please um, please let me know when but for anyone that took leave um, up until February of this year <coughs> due to the fact that they had COVID they were not charged sick leave for that time is that if if they were fully vaccinated they were not charged sick leave is that true um let me make sure I understand the question. If they were sick and with COVID, they would take they would be taking their leave. They would be home sick. I think you might be asking me if an employee was asked to stay home while we assessed if their test results came back positive. Um, that that's a question as well. Yes. <laughs> then the question is that the school system would have charged uh, if, the, if the employee was not vaccinated, they had to stay home. And so it would be charged to their leave. Because if you recall, the guidance from the CDC said that if, they, if the employee had no symptoms, was vaccinated, and later boosted, it depends at which point in time we're talking about, Correct. Yeah. then the employee could come to work if they had no symptoms. So it's just a matter of what, when, in, when in the course of the ever-changing and adjusting guidance of the CDC, uh, and depending on whether the employee was vaccinated and then later boosted, um, what is constant is if the employee was not vaccinated and displayed symptoms, uh, we needed the employee to stay home until a result from a COVID test was completed. And at that time, for that specific instance, the employee would be taking their leave. Okay, but just, just so I'm clear and the public's clear, if they were fully vaccinated per CDC guidelines, so we'll just say that, <laughs> that that takes care of any date issued, 
and they in fact were shown to to have COVID, then they were not charged sick leave. I'm just trying to. I just want to make sure I understand that. I'm they had or they had paid administration, paid administrative leave. So if an employee was ill and needed to stay home because they could not do, they had symptoms and they could not do their job, they needed to stay home regardless of whether they were vaccinated or unvaccinated. There was a process that we instituted um, for employees who were vaccinated and through contact tracing were found to have, through the contact tracing process were found to have gotten COVID within the school environment and had to be out because they were ill. It wasn't like they were asymptomatic or they had very few symptoms or no symptoms and they had to be out. And for those employees, we, um, that we could make that link, we provided um, some leave from the school system. And I believe we mentioned in the memo that I sent to the board, the number of employees of which we um, did that for this school year. Yes, I think 51. Yes. And, it, and just to amplify this, employees may under the current contract may request additional sick leave if they need it. Is that a true statement? So yes, so there is language in both the EACC contract, current contract, and the AFSCME current contract that delineates the requests that em current employees can do for additional leave if they have none at the current point in time. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from any other board members? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Navarro, for providing um, the update to the board. You're welcome. Okay. Next is Mr. Schwartz with the legislative update. So the session is, is getting there, not quite done yet. Uh, Mabe had a Mabe Legislative Committee meeting this morning. Ms. Brown and Mr. Lucas were part of that as well. Uh, they highlighted several bills that are moving along that we're really following very closely at this point in the session. And I want to highlight just a few of them. I did po post on board docs a more complete list, and Mabe, of course, has a lot more information as well if you would like to. Uh, look at the MABE website. The first bill I want to highlight is the P3 bill that was mentioned earlier. I just want to say one additional thing about that. I know we've already had a lot of discussion about it, but there is also a Senate bill uh, as well. There's a House bill and a Senate bill. Both bills have passed their respective houses and have crossed over in the same form, so it's just a matter of time before one of those bills is passed by both houses. So we do expect that bill to pass. The recommendations would be due from the committee looking at P3. Uh, by December of 2022. Um, as Ms. Wilson noted, there is a process currently in law that allows us to use P3s, uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, there's no need for additional legislation, but I will note that Prince George's County did have additional legislation clarifying exactly how it was to be used in Prince George's County. So the work group, if it wanted to move forward with P3s, could recommend additional legislation or could allow for P3s under current law. That's something the work group will be looking at. Senate Bill 640, House Bill 1426, primary and secondary education maintenance of effort requirements, alters the maintenance of effort uh, law to clarify that, uh, that boards of education would not be hurt by the decrease in maintenance of effort from the COVID pandemic. As you know, last year a bill passed that held us harmless when there was an enrollment drop. And as we also know, print, uh, maintenance of effort is based on enrollment. So that bill that passed last year was only for one year, and so our enrollment drop still would be affecting us for 2023 fiscal year. 
this bill, Senate Bill 640, House Bill 1426, would uh, clarify that the calculation for maintenance of effort would be based on, uh, on the hire of uh, several calculations, which would result for Charles County in a maintenance of effort of about $200 million, which is pretty much met what we got last year. Uh, we're hoping, of course, for more than that. We're, we're confident the county is going to come through with more than that because they are supportive of public education, recognizing that our needs are greater than just the basic amount they gave us last year, especially considering the blueprint uh, is, is coming into effect. Senate Bill 617, House Bill 547, deals with access for digital tools for students. This is a bill that uh, Mabe and Pizan have worked very closely on with staff at the General Assembly level uh, and with school systems for the last year or so, trying to get this bill into a format that we can all live with. It looks like the bill will be passing. The bill passed the Senate already, and I think it will pass the House as well. Mabe is, and Pizan were still working on some last minute amendments to clarify exactly what the access would be for all students to all digital tools. But it, what it's intending to do is at least enforce what federal law requires, which is that we provide equal access or equivalent access as best we can when possible for students to uh, access uh, digital tools in the school setting uh, with or without disabilities. House Bill 136, Senate Bill 299, uh, is public and not public school seizure action, seizure action plans, which deals with just that, seizure action plans in schools for students who have seizure disorders. Uh, the bill would, would require us to create plans for these students, which of course we do, I think, pretty much as, as uh, uh, under current law. It also requires additional training for staff to recognize this, the signs of, of seizures and how to uh, deal with them when they happen in the school setting. This bill has been in, in uh, the General Assembly for the last several years. It's never gotten close to passing, but this year it looks like it will. Uh, there have been, uh, there's a House bill and a Senate bill that passed the respective houses and have crossed over. So we're expecting this bill to pass this year. Senate bill 119, House bill 84, education, crimes on school grounds application. Uh, I've mentioned this bill before. This bill will take the provision out of the education article that makes it a criminal offense for students to disrupt the school setting. There's current law in the education article that makes it a misdemeanor for any, any individual to disrupt the school uh, educational setting, uh, whether it be parents, visitors, or staff or students. Uh, this bill, the intent is to decriminalize student behavior. So if a student disrupts the school setting, we should treat that as a school disruption under the code of conduct and not as a criminal offense. So that's the intent of the bill. This bill's been in, again, several years in a row. It's never uh, moved, but this year it looks like it will move. It's passed the House and the Senate in slightly different formats. I think they'll work out that difference and that bill should pass this session. Uh, May talked about another dozen bills or so, and, and there are other bills, of course, that we're looking at as well. So if you have any questions about those or other bills, I'd be glad to try to answer those questions. I just forwarded, sorry, um, I just forwarded the list that, uh, that was discussed at May today, and it goes into a little more detail on all of them. So if you have any questions. We shout out to Mr. Schwartz first. So, yeah. Thank you. Mr. Hancock. Thank you, Chairman Lucas. Thank you, uh, Mr. Schwartz. I have a question on uh, Senate Bill 528, the Climate Solutions uh, Now Act. Yes. The bill would, among many other provisions, require the purchase of zero emission school buses in fiscal year 2024. Yes. So my questions are, are there school buses that produce zero emissions that we can buy? <laughs> and does that mean we just have to start buying them at that date or is there a certain number that we have to meet that's uh, that's right around the corner <laughs> it is this bill is a pretty extensive building with climate change uh, across the board on a lot of issues and this is just one small one well, not a small for us but one small provision of a very large bill and the bill would require us to buy uh, basically electric school buses starting in 2024 those buses are available, they're very expensive, but they are available. The problem, of course, isn't the buses, it's the infrastructure that would be required to operate those buses. And the other issue, of course, is for uh, rural counties as large as Charles, but even larger in the state, um, you'd have to make sure that the buses are charged enough to do their whole route on a single uh, charge. Uh, 
there are, there are only a few school systems in the state, I think, that are would be ready to move forward with this. So the bill does, I think, have the, the out that says when feasible or when possible, and I can't remember the exact wording, uh, that, that the buses would have to be purchased. But the intent of the General Assembly is that we do move toward zero emission school buses. Uh, again, that's a very expensive proposition for us. Yeah, I would imagine so. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. So moving on, we have um, action items on some policies. Are you going to present anything? I am not. I'm here to answer okay. any questions, but we're ready for adoption for all of these policies. So we discussed these at, um, at the previous board meeting. And if there are any questions from any board members? All right, seeing none, um, can we approve these at once or individually? It depends. Depending on the wording of the motion, you can right. approve okay. all these at one time. I move to accept uh, policy series 2000. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. Board will entertain a motion for the other policies. Motion to approve the 7,000 series. Second. Made by Mr. Hancock, seconded by uh, Ms. Brown. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you very much, it's unanimous. Next is policy 5116.5. Second. It's made by Ms. Brown and seconded by Ms. Wilson. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Policy 5117. So moved. I, I move to accept. Second. <laughs> I knew what you meant. Uh, <laughs> made by Ms. McGraw and seconded by Mr. Hancock. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. And finally, policy 9123. I move to accept policy 9123. It's made by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Ms. Brown. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that is a unanimous vote as well. Thank you very much. Motion to adjourn made Second. by. Ms. Abel, seconded Second. by Ms. Wilson. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good, good meeting tonight. Thanks. Thanks, Kyle.